So the new Candyman movie came out recently. Yep. The, yep. the one that Nia DaCosta directed and Jordan Peele co-wrote and produced. Yep. And, and we watched it together with our wives. Mm-hmm. Not, not right. physically in the same space, but we watched it at the exact same time, talking to one another, you in New Jersey and me in Chicago. That's right. And it was, uh, it was fun and frightening and absolutely hilarious to hear our yeah. wives going bananas when, uh, when they got really scared about something in the movie. Mostly they were grossed out at some parts. Yeah, yeah. Danielle just said that's gross and Stephanie said that's fucked up at the same time. And uh, I, I had this moment of like looking back on ourselves, on our various couches watching in our respective places and kind of reminded me of that scene at the top of Thriller. You've got uh, Michael Jackson sitting there in the audience having popcorn. With, and, with, with Ola Ray. Yeah, yeah, beautiful Ola Ray. And then the scene when, you know, she screams and popcorn goes everywhere. Uh, that's, that's how I imagined this moment with our wives watching this film. It was fun. I'm Khalil Gibran Muhammad. And I'm Ben Austin. We're two best friends. One black. One white. I'm a historian. And I'm a journalist. And this is some of my best friends are. As in, I'm not a racist. Hmm. Some of my best friends are. Dot, dot, dot. Fill in the blank. (laughs) (laughs) In this show, we wrestle with the challenges. And the absurdities. Of a deeply divided and unequal country. And just so you know, we will be talking about the new Candyman. So if you haven't seen it yet, there will be spoilers. But you should listen to this show no matter what, even if you haven't seen it yet. You know what a huge fan I am of the 1992 original Candyman. Yeah, man. Uh, You've written about it. I wrote about it extensively in High Risers, my book about Chicago's most iconic housing project, Cabrini Green. The 1992 Candyman and Nia DaCosta's are both set there. And these movies, you know, they they tell us so much about the so-called inner city, both in the early 1990s and today. That's right. We talked about movies in an earlier episode. That's right. Interracial buddy movies. Yeah, it was a great episode. Everyone should listen. But we don't want to give the wrong impression about our podcast. I mean, you know, we're not Siskel and Ebert, although, you know, Maybe we could be, but our show (laughs) isn't going to focus on movies every week. Yep, that's right. But the two Candyman movies were too juicy, too haunted to pass up. They're the perfect way for us to explore not just portrayals of the inner city in the early 1990s and in the early 2020s, but actually what cities in America were like back then and how and why they've changed to today. Yeah, I mean, these movies are are social commentary as well as cultural touchstones of then and now. And I think, I think that's what we should talk about today. I think so too, because when I think about the first Candyman as a groundbreaking, trailblazing horror film, I think about that moment when, as we were coming of age in the 1980s, there was Freddy Krueger, who was terrorizing high school suburbanite white kids. There was Michael Myers doing the yep. same thing in the Halloween series. Yep, Jason. That's right, Jason for summer camp. And then, and what do what all those <laughs> horror film monsters have in common that you're getting at? They're white dudes. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so Candyman. The thing that's that's so groundbreaking about Candyman. It's a weird form of representation, mm-hmm. but it's a black horror film monster. That's right. And 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 of a kind that is meant to be mainstream white audience. It's not, you know, an independent film. It's not Blackula. And, you know, a black monster in America is loaded with all kinds of meaning, <laughs> right? I mean, like that is, that's a, that's just a loaded thing. I like that. So, I like it. Can you say that again? A, say, what'd you say? A black monster in America wow. is loaded with all kinds of meaning. Yeah, yeah. And that's kind of what we're going to talk about today. Yeah. Well, let's get into it. Cool.
Kalu, let's focus first on the 1992 film, the original. Um, here's the premise of the movie, mm -hmm. all right? So it's set in Chicago, and there's a white graduate student named Helen, played by Virginia Madsen, and she's doing her research on urban legends. An entire community starts attributing the daily horrors of their lives to a mythical figure. And one of the urban legends she's been hearing about is of the Candyman, mm. a monster that everyone is talking about called Candyman. Right. And Candyman is sort of like this Bloody Mary ghost story legend where if you say his name five times, he appears. And, you know, he's a hook-handed apparition, and then he, he kills you. Um, you know, so Helen is hearing these stories, and it's, it's interesting that the story of the Candyman it sort of works in two different ways. Um, so he is said to live at Cabrini Green, which is this large public housing complex in Chicago on the near north side. Cabrini Green. Candyman country. And early in the movie, Virginia Madsen is doing research and interviewing people about this legend. And she, a, a cleaning woman at the university, a black woman, overhears her and says, are you, are you talking about the Candyman? Candyman, huh? Yes, have you heard of him? Mm-hmm. You doing a study on it? Yes, I am. What have you heard? Everybody's scared of him once it gets dark. Well, one of the things that I really like about the first film, and I remember being sort of surprised by when I saw it, before, I mean, for the first time, is how much it borrows from and comments on the real world. I mean, you know, they use a murder that actually happened in Chicago in 1987 as the inspiration for the whole film. A woman is in her apartment in another public housing development in Chicago, and she calls the police because somebody is trying to push through the mirror in her bathroom. Someone is trying to come in from the apartment next door into her bathroom, and, and somehow the construction is so shoddy that you could just push right through and come in and be in there. It's like a home invasion. And, and she calls the police. The police don't come, and she's eventually murdered. There's actually a great Chicago Reader story about this by Steve Bagheera. They came in through the bathroom mirror that, that captures the, both, both how terrifying this is and also really like the state of public housing at that time. Yeah, but that's crazy as shit, right? I mean, not only crazy, yeah. but super scary. Um, yeah. Because then you're thinking like anybody could come literally through the walls and kill me at any moment. Yeah, that's the stuff of horror. That's right? the stuff of I horror. I mean, so, and the stuff of horror is, you know, that didn't happen a hundred times. But if it happens once and it's a story that gets told around, mm -hmm. then what you just said of how terrifying that is, that, that someone could just come into your space inside your own home, you know, that, that if you're in a dark room, that there's an entrance that someone else could come in. And so, so this film picks up on that uh, real killing um, and plays with yeah. it in a way that... I, I, it, is, is sort of fueled by these fears that outsiders have of Cabrini Green anyway. Like, that's like the real truth that then fuels these nightmares that people imagine. Yeah. Like, there's just death and destruction and murder and mayhem around every corner. So the Candyman works in two ways as a legend, as an urban legend and an urban myth. It's something that mm -hmm. people within the Cabrini Green community tell themselves. Mm -hmm. And it's also a way that outsiders see the community. Yeah. But then, like you said, like, yeah, there's also a way that public housing and actually Cabrini Green at this time is almost the personification of the scary image of the inner city. Um, and so setting it there is really captures this idea of how outsiders see the black ghetto. And so in the movie, that means like Helen goes from the library and she's like, well, I got to go to Cabrini Green. Mm -hmm. um, but, but even going back to the director, He's British, and he has this Clive Barker short story set in, in Liverpool. And the idea to put it in Chicago and in Cabrini Green in sort of this idea, this scary image of the inner city, is, is both like problematic, mm -hmm. but also super interesting. Because like in the history of horror, if you think about how horror had always worked up to this point, it always happened in outsider places. It's places that are beyond society. So the woods is like the most, you know, traditional historical one or like the yeah. haunted house on the hill or like, you know, for much of our youth, they like set it at, there were these horror movies set in the suburbs, which is a funny dynamic. Yeah. And, and even if you think about it, you know, th that's what um, Jordan Peele exploits in Get Out. Like, you know, it's, a, it's the suburbs, the place where you wouldn't expect it. 
But then you think like, so in 1992, where, what, are, what are people most afraid of? And, you know, for this director to think like, okay, the thing that people are most afraid of are actually in a crowded inner city and like the most, the center, center of the inner city in these sort of isolated spots of public housing, which are built in a certain way of like many, many towers surrounded by, uh, by, by huge plots of land with no through streets. Yep. You know, so they're like islands of poverty, of black poverty. Yep. And and that's that's really interesting. He actually goes to, to Cabrini Green when he gets to Chicago to sort of scout the locations. Didn't you interview the director? I'm a journalist. Yes. <laughs> I, I reached out to him, uh, Bernard Rose, who wrote and directed the first film. And the thing that he sees there, this is what he told me, hmm. is that he actually just sees real people. Right. Like, like it's, it's scary as fuck when you go in there, he said. Like, you know, you go into the hallways and the, the lights are out and the, the stairwells smell of piss and, you know, the elevators don't work and there's graffiti. But also just like a lot of real people, like having, you know, you know living their lives. Yeah. And to him, that actually was made it more powerful to set the story there because that's that's the difference when myth and reality like have this this distance you know when people are terrified of a place that isn't necessarily even always terrifying yeah um, yeah that that's where you got people yeah so what you're really saying is a lot of this movie helps to tell the bigger story that you tell in your book high risers right definitely yes high risers is really a history of cabrini green but because cabrini green as an as both a place and an idea is so important in in Chicago history and in inner city history and in American history, it's really a much larger story of of America and about how we imagine poverty and race and how it plays out over time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. In fact, when I used to teach uh, history of urban America, I used to point out that when public housing was first conceived in the uh, early days of the Great Depression. It was really, truly conceived for white people. And in fact, if I have this correct, uh, the urban historian Tom Segru estimated that for every one public housing built with black people in mind, 12 public housing units were built for whites. Uh, so it's far, a far cry from, say, the late 30s and 40s to uh, the 70s and 80s and 90s with a conception of public housing itself. Let's go back to the film's version of Cabrini Green in 1992. I want to talk about one scene in particular. Like, the, the movie mm. focuses on public housing. Mm. Like, uh, Helen and her graduate student partner, they, they go into public housing. They go to Cabrini Green. They're scared. Uh, they, they get there, and they're, they're guys out front, the lobby boys who were, you know, maybe selling drugs or hanging out. Right. Um, and they they pretend that they're police in a way to to sort of you know protect themselves. They walk up the stairwells. It's scary, um, you know. But what they find there, you know, they they find graffiti and then they find some evidence of of sort of this myth. But like really, what they're looking into is just like it's just like how how this place plays in the civic imagination and the public imagination. And you know, I want to talk about one scene in particular. Mm. All right. So so after Helen goes there. She meets a little boy <laughs> and he says, you know, uh, do you want to see Candyman? And like, that's all she wants to see. So she says, take me there. Right. And he takes her outside the high rises. There really aren't a lot of people there. There's just, you just see buildings. And there's a public bathroom that he says to go enter. And he says, you know, Candyman killed someone in there. Candyman's in there? My friend Charlie faced so. A boy got killed there. Who was he? Ain't hey, sure. Charlie tell me you're weird. <laughs> this this <Yeah>. is like <laughs> this really is like the the a uh, haunted house. This place that like only the most ridiculously naive person would walk into. Yeah, like, yeah, and you know, like like my wife would never use a public bathroom anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you could imagine about like this public bathroom in public housing that's abandoned, but also completely on view. So Helen is outside this bathroom and the boy is like, you know, I'm not going in there. <laughs> and of course, Helen goes in. I mean, this is the story of every horror movie. And of course, she goes in all alone. Right. 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 <laughs> and and she goes in there and it's it is disgusting. Like she finally goes into the last stall and, you know, it's like building, building, building. Mm -hmm. And there's this whole weird motif of bees, which we, you know, maybe more than we get into here, but she sees suddenly all these bees. And then she turns around. There are men standing there. And there's a guy in a long leather trench coat. 
and he's holding a hook in his hand. The guy right. isn't Candyman, but he is dressed exactly like Candyman. And he says, I hear you looking for Candyman, bitch. Well, you found him. And then he hits her in the head with the, with the hook. And it's, the story is really powerful. It's amazing, actually, because it pushes against the idea of monsters. Crime is terrible. Right. People get hurt, mm -hmm. and people commit crime. And people die. And people die. And yet, that's different than saying something is a monster. And that divide, these are just, there's something very mundane in how this is depicted. It completely cuts against the monster image of criminals, of somebody who commits a crime. They, you see them sauntering off at the end slowly with just sort of like the grayness of Chicago in the background. There's not, nothing amazing or, or, you know, supernatural has happened. The exact opposite. Right. And, and, and maybe that's a moment where the film crosses over into a kind of social realism, which is to speak to a kind of um, senselessness of the mun mundane everyday violence that happens there. Um, yeah. That, that yeah. you know, anybody at any moment could show up and do you harm. And that's, yeah. that's, that's the part of the film that is the social commentary um, of, the, of the period in which this film is made. Yeah, I, I, I totally see your point. And you're right that, you know, here we are, a black man attacks a white woman. It triggers all these responses. And yet the movie does something when it, it makes it so much less sensational. And it pushes back against it in all these ways. And I know this is kind of a leap, but like when you think about the moment of that time when we're in this sort of uh, hysteria about black males com committing violence, and this movie doesn't engage in that in the same way. You mean the movie wants us to see their humanity and wants to position the response as something about Cabrini Green as a public housing project that's been failed rather than a place where monsters are around every corner. Yeah, yeah, I think that's exactly right. Yeah. And in that sense, what comes in the actual real world with these kinds of racist stereotypes is actually about eliminating monsters. So this is a moment when the, the image of the black quote-unquote criminal as monster is, is sort of taking off all over the place. Mm -hmm. Like Rodney King is beaten so badly because the police imagined him as a brute, a monster. Right. With and, superhuman power you know, who could... With could, superhuman powers. Could destroy and, eight armed cops with guns and billy clubs right. with one fell swoop. And, and, and the same thing, you know, if we think back to 1989 and the Central Park jogger case, this sensational case, these five youths are, you know, talked about as wilding teens. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're, they're like packs of wild animals, wild dogs. Like a super predator is not that different than a monster. You know, it's like supernatural power of these, of these black kids. And, and these things, you know, these lead to, to actual real policies. Right. 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 These policies, the, the, these stories, these, these fuel both in the popular imagination, journalistic coverage, actual crime statistics, uh, and the political ratcheting up between first Republicans and then Democrats and Bill Clinton uh, and Joe Biden, who at the time was the Senate and, and had long by that time been leading various crime bill efforts from the 1980s are going to write the biggest, baddest, most punitive crime bill in U.S. history yeah. in 1994 yeah. and pass it. Yeah. So I asked at the beginning, you know, what role do monsters play in American society? And so here we have these, this monstrous place, Cabrini Green. And, you know, the thing that happens, as you said, you get things like the crime bill and you get truth in sentencing and you get mandatory minimums and you get super aggressive policing. Mm -hmm. But you also get the erasure of this neighborhood, yeah. of this community. Because if it's a monstrous place and it doesn't really have humanity, then the only thing to do and even only the only responsible thing to do is to get rid of it. And so across the country, starting in the 1990s, 250,000 units of public housing end up being demolished. And at Cabrini Green, this neighborhood on the near north side of Chicago, it's completely all the high rises, all 23 of them are torn down. At its peak, Cabrini Green had 25,000 residents are pushed elsewhere in the city. Yeah. And so that community doesn't exist in the same way today as it did back then. Yeah, that's that's really uh 
It's really fascinating for this reason because the second film picks up exactly where that leaves off. This mm. the, the the remake, uh, and so this theme about erasure, this theme about gentrification, this theme about um, what do you do when you disappear a community, and what are the lingering effects of that. Yep. Let's talk yep. about let's let's talk about Candyman. With, Jumping forward in time, twenty twenty one. That's right, and even the idea that. You know, if if public housing can evolve, maybe monsters can evolve too. So in Nia DaCosta's remake of Candyman, this just come out recently. Um, yeah. One of the most striking things that we see early on is not even something to be seen. It's to be heard. And it is the a remake of The Candyman, the original song from the Willy Wonka uh, film. Mm-hmm. Um, about the chocolate factory, Willy Wonka yeah. and the chocolate factory, which of course for generations has been, particularly for our childhood, has been this delightful movie about a fun house of candy. And the parable is, you know, be careful that you get too much of what you wish for. And, and it is a kind yeah. of house of horrors. And so the, this song is playing and like, you know, lyrics like who can take a sunrise, sprinkle it with dew, cover it with chocolate and a miracle or two, the candy man. Oh, yes, the, the candy, candy man, man can. can. Right. Yeah. Like Sam, Sammy Davis sings a version, which is what I love. That's right. So there's so in this moment of this film coming on before we see anything, we hear this song um, and it goes from being kind of in a in a major chord uh, with happy notes to being distorted. Mm. So, so that opening totally plays with that idea of insider, outside, or horror stories, yep. right? Yep. Because there, there's a guy that residents are talking about being the candy man. And, and, the, and it's basically a lesson don't take candy from strangers. Right. He, you know, there, there's a story going around that he put razor blades in candy. That's right. Which I, which I, then, wanted, I was so happy to hit, for you to bring that up because I <laughs> wanted to tell you, I have the distinct memory of the first Halloween when I was a little kid in Chatham on the south side of Chicago. I was at my grandmom's house. I was probably six years old and about to head out with one of my aunts uh, to go trick-or-treating. And guess what they all said? Be there careful. Might be razor bl- there might be razor blades in the candy. When I was reporting for High Risers, real life Cabrini Green residents who grew up there in the 1960s and the 1970s, they said adults used to tell them to watch out for the witch underneath the Ogden Avenue Bridge. And, and it was a way to scare children so they stayed away from trouble and, and came home before dark. You know, wow. imagine how, how radically different that is from the 1990s when their homes in public housing are imagined as the actual scary place to stay away from. I mean, look, we're, we're, we're really talking about fear. And that fear leads to the demolition of 23 towers, all the towers at Cabrini Green. I believe the last one comes down in 2011. And these, you know, luxury apartment buildings pop up everywhere. And there's all kinds of fine dining and stores and, and everything that you would expect in a place that has now erased an entire community where gentrification is what comes next. And in that sense, that's where this new film opens up with two of our main characters, Anthony McCoy and Brianna Cartwright, a couple who live together in one of these luxury apartments. It's not just the inside that counts. It's close to the gallery. Yeah, it's very practical. Okay, what is wrong with it? Well, nothing. As I told my sister many times, the neighborhood is haunted. They're super they're, bougie. They're bougie. They're they're living. They're living on the other. They're living side in the luxury apartment. The trauma of of the 1990s. The trauma of the, the the dangerous black community that no one cared about. This is you know some version of a kind of post racial good life. 
Uh, yeah. And it is accented by her brother, um, who is gay and happy and loving, and he has a, a white partner, and they make a lot of jokes about being this fun-loving couple. And so, you know, we are in a space that is no longer about the horrors and pathologies of a black community. No, and their their conversations are specifically about real estate, yep. about the neighborhood, and about pricing, and you know about their apartments. Um, you know, they're 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 they've sort of adopted the ethos of this new world. So in this in this opening dinner party scene, where we learn that Yaya is trying to find his muse and that he's lost his way as a kind of metaphor for a black man that doesn't realize his own history. Yeah. He learns for the first time about the urban legend of Candyman. Uh, so there's a wonderful interplay between how the character of Anthony McCoy uh, learns about Candyman, this, this what is now being repositioned as an urban legend, um, that now he's like, hmm, I need to study this for myself. And so yeah. just like Helen, uh, Virginia Matson's character in the first story, he's going to figure out what is this story of Candyman for himself. Some of the things that have happened to Cabrini over the years, violence just so extreme, so bizarre. It's almost as if violence became the ritual. The worst part, the residents are afraid to call the police. A code of honor, perhaps. So it was so fascinating hearing uh, Anthony do this research and, and hearing Helen tell this story for the first time is he's finding his muse because he's an artist. And this film actually uses the art world and and the way that art is a is a vehicle for for expression and for history telling, and so he's gonna have a conversation also in another scene with this obnoxious and condescending art critic, uh, where she's basically gonna challenge him um, on how he's telling his story. No, oh, it, it speaks all right. <laughs> Speaking didactic knee cliches about the ambient violence of the gentrification cycle. But your kind are the real pioneers of that cycle, you know? Excuse me? Artists. Artists descend upon disenfranchised neighborhoods, dividing cheap rent so that they can dick around in their studios without the crushing burden of a day job. That that process itself, as, as one of the characters says in a scene, that the city cuts off the community and waits for it to die and then invites mostly white artists and promises yeah. a whole foods if they stick it out for a couple of years. I mean, if That's that great. isn't a devastating line uh, yeah, yeah, for this yeah. moment and a powerful critique of kind of the art world itself as a kind of... Um, soft underbelly of the violence of gender gentrification. It's just powerful. Yeah. In Beautiful. the end, this scene is, is much about the erasure of Cabrini Green as an act of gentrification and violence, but also about whether we get to remember that story in the way that it happened. In a place like Chicago that gets destroyed, not from the enemy within, but from the enemy without. From, yeah, yeah. I mean, from the that, violence, literally, of white supremacy. That is the premise of this remake. The, the interactions that occur in this film between Brianna, who is Anthony's girlfriend, and her position as the person who's introducing Anthony to the art world becomes a interplay between whether or not Anthony can make art that speaks to the conditions that Black people live under, or whether his art yeah. is an abstraction. Um, and there's this wonderful line where, where she basically says to him that your work uh, is too literal. And this, this discussion about whether Black people get to tell their stories about what they've experienced becomes a metaphor for forgetting the history of the violence that Black people actually endured. So that this powerful notion of of defining what counts for what version of art or what version of Black people's stories get told is what is being positioned as another form of violence through the art world itself. And so then the art world itself is a kind of monster in the story. It is the vehicle for whitewashing. It is using its power and prestige to 
to limit the voice of black people in such a way that they can't actually tell their stories through their art. Yeah, so the, the movie starts with this idea that there's a candy man roaming in Cabrini Green. Yep. You know, and the idea that he he passes out candy and there are razor blades in it. Yep. Um, and so we have this character, a boy, who is it goes into the laundry room and, you know, that's scary. He's all alone in the laundry room in Cabrini Green. And then this guy emerges from a hole in the wall, which is sort of also harking back to the first that's film. That's right, and to the, the, and the scene the you described vanity. already, right? Yeah. This, this is the uh, restroom scene. But then we see that this guy comes out and he doesn't have a hook for a hand. He has a prosthetic and he has just candy and he seems to be sort of simple-minded in some way. Yeah. And the boy is no longer scared. He can see that this is sort of an innocent and that there's been a mythology that's come around him, but he's already shouted. And the police run in and instead of sort of accepting his view, they, they, they beat this man to death. Yeah, yeah. And it, it literally, instead of them coming in to see what's wrong with the kid and asking questions, they come in and kill an innocent man. The film inverts policing not as saviors who are often, as my mama would say, uh, a day late and a dollar short, uh, yeah, yeah. but actually are the vehicle of violence in this film. This is a film about police violence as a kind of monstrous crime committed against the Black community. This is a Black Lives Matter film. This is a film mm. that wants to reposition the narrative of the pathologies of super predators in public housing in the Black community to a story about the pathologies of structural racism. And so it, in, in these three ways, from public housing to art and a kind of erasure of Black stories uh, to police violence and the killing of unarmed people. There are powerful scenes in this film that tell a new backstory to Candyman, which, spoiler alert, um, really become a play on this notion of say his name or her name, although in, in this rendition, I think all the victims of racial terror, whether they are killed by white mobs in Chicago uh, or lynch mobs somewhere else, the story of Candyman becomes attached to victims of white mob violence and police violence. And so the roster of name calling that is told in this backstory in the film is, is a way of saying that the real monsters that the Black community have been fighting against are monsters that have been literally killing us all this time. Yeah, we have an actual monster in the film, Candyman, who is this killing people. And he becomes, in some ways, as you're saying, almost created by centuries of trauma. That it, the, the trauma almost manifests in this murderer, this monstrous murderer, this supernatural phantasm. Right. Um, and so when you think about what do monsters tell us, like you said, it's over a century of extrajudicial killings. Sometimes not even extrajudicial. There's one where we just see uh, a little boy being executed. Right. Um, you know, who has been tried and sentenced. And... And then there's this strange way where, like, the, the say his name, which is, you know, you say Candyman's name five times, and then suddenly it's tied to, uh, you know, like saying Rakia Boyd's name or, or Sandra Bland or Breonna Taylor. Or Breonna Taylor, who idea. carries the name of, the, of the, one of the lead characters. Yeah, and so the, you know, Candyman becomes a kind of form of vengeance, this is almost a you know a tool that's being wielded to get to get uh, to equal the playing field that we see the victims of Candyman in the movie right they're all white yep every one of them that's right. So we started out talking about you know what does a black monster in America mean like here we have a black horror film monster and that it's loaded with meaning. And part of the meaning is to push back against even the monster narrative itself. It's interesting. I don't think, I don't think the second film is a, is a rejection exactly of the first one because it's sort of like it, it is playing with so much of it and even like importing so much of it. Um, but these ideas of, of the urban legends, which are part of how of the comprehension of of the the state of the city and the state of violence and particularly the state of violence in black communities. Um, Candyman is is an urban legend. Yeah. Well, I do. And, yeah. 
well, just to say one thing about importing, because I think, um, I think that you're right, but I think it's importing for the purpose of correcting. You know, if there is a, such a thing as <laughs> revisionist history, this film wants to rewrite the history of the original film. This film is saying racism never stopped. And racism yeah, is yeah. more than a lynch mob. Racism is more than the Klan. Racism is built into the built environment of our neighborhoods. And it is an ongoing project. It is built into the way that our institutions either do or don't acknowledge Black humanity. And it is in the ongoing um, realities of state-sanctioned violence in law enforcement. And so there's no origin story that is separate and apart from the daily lives and realities of Black people um, in this version of the film. And that's why, that's why I think the film is so powerful um, as a commentary on where we are today. Yes. Candyman. 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 Come on, man. Don't, you're gonna don't let say, me say it. Uh, hey, gonna, <laughs> look, look. If you say it, that's on you. I, I will okay. have nothing to do no, with this no, or the I'm or not, the outcome. I'm not that kind of person. I'm stopping right there. <laughs> All right. Well, that was a great discussion. I mean, I've been thinking about, as I said, Candyman for my book and for for those thirty years. So uh, uh, I'm glad we had this opportunity to talk. Yeah. Yeah. We we should give Nia DaCosta and, and Jordan Peele. Uh, and other filmmakers a shout out for making this film because what what great hey, material. Hey, they should give us a shout no, out. No, no. <laughs> but what great material, you know, to yeah. learn more about about uh, your work and, uh, and and a little bit about mine. So, uh, yeah. all right. Yeah. Love you, man. Love you too. Some of My Best Friends Are is a production of Pushkin Industries. The show is written and hosted by me, Khalil Gibran Muhammad, and my best friend, Ben Austin. It's produced by Cher Vincent, Ken Wood, and edited by Karen Shakurji. Our engineer is Martin Gonzalez. Our associate editor is Keyshell Williams. And our showrunner is Sasha Mathias. Our executive producers are Lee Tal Molad and Mia Lobel. At Pushkin, thanks to Heather Fain, Carly Migliori, John Schnars, and Jacob Weisberg. Our theme song, Little Lily, is by fellow Chicagoan Avery R. Young from his amazing album Tubman. You will definitely want to check out more of his music at his website, averyryoung.com. You can find Pushkin on all social platforms at Pushkin Pods, and you can sign up for our newsletter at pushkin.fm. To find more Pushkin podcasts, listen on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you like to listen. If you love this show, and we hope you do, and others from Pushkin Industries, consider becoming a Pushnik. Pushnik is a podcast subscription that offers bonus content and uninterrupted listening for $4.99 a month. Look for Pushnik exclusively on Apple Podcast subscriptions. Some of my best friends are. Some of my best friends are. Some of my best friends are. <laughs> if you say it five times in a mirror, Khalil, yeah, you know what's going to happen. Say, say, we're going to show up. Say, say our names. <laughs> say our names. I love it.